Hello. Today, we are going to be in the first part of our two-part series on Small Ruminant 101. Today, we are going to be focusing on selection. Before we get started, I want to give you some information about myself. My name is Logan Hickerson. I'm a UT TSU Extension agent here in Relford County. I specifically work with the 4-H youth involved in livestock and poultry products projects. I graduated from MTSU with a degree in animal science. A little bit of my livestock history. Uh, I grew up on a commercial cattle farm. I had the opportunity to work throughout high school and college at a farrow to finish hog operation in Murfreesboro. And my small ruminant history uh, goes specifically to goats. Uh, I started raising goats back in 2007. We had commercial boar goats at that point, and over the years, we have grown our herd to focus specifically on raising show goats uh, for the 4-H and FFA youth uh, around the country. Today, as I stated, we are going to be talking about selection, and before we get started, I want to give you a definition of what selection means. It is the action or fact of carefully choosing someone or something as being the best or most suitable. Now that definition certainly uh, is correct, but we need to try to apply that. So as producers, that just means identifying animals with desirable traits that we like, and then choosing those animals and using them uh, for that purpose. Those desirable traits, they could definitely be different for different people. Uh, and that's for you uh, as a producer to decide. Some desirable traits I have listed here are growth rate, reproduction, carcass traits, performance, and disease resistance. Certainly, you could have other desirable traits to add to this list. These are just a few that I thought uh, would be good for an example. So today, as we begin talking about what selection is or what that means, I think it's important to look at selection from each sector of the industry. We will go through consumer, packer, feeder, commercial producer, and purebred breeder and see what their traits or criteria that they select for are, and that might help us in our decisions for our specific program. The consumer, price and value, is always going to be the most important thing that they are thinking about when purchasing their products. They want to make sure that they're getting the most value for the price that they are paying. They also are going to be looking for consistency in their product. They want to make sure every time that they go and buy that they are getting a product that is the exact same as what they have previously bought. Also, something that will be important for consumers is the availability on certain holidays and around certain times of year when they need specifically your product, they want to be able to get that. They also are going to be consuming these products, so they want to make sure it has a good taste and flavor and that it's certainly a safe and healthy product for them to consume. Next is the packer. The packer is the one that's going to be looking for a lot of those carcass traits. Dressing percentage, quality grade, yield grade are certainly going to be at the top of the list for the packer. They aren't putting any money besides labor into what they are doing, so they want to make sure that those yields are going to be as high as they can be because that's where their margin for making money comes in. The feeder. The feeder is the person that's going to be putting in a lot of money into your product that you as a producer would be selling. So they want to make sure that they are going to get a healthy animal, an animal that will gain, and an animal that has some feed efficiency. They want to make sure that they are getting the highest return on their investment of feed for their animals. Now some producers you're not just selecting only for taking these animals to the meat market. Some people might be selecting for show. 
That's what I do as a producer of show goats. So a few things that I might add here in this section, because certainly the 4-H and FFA youth would fall under the category of feeder, I want to add some competitive value, some show ring presence to my animals. And so that's something that that 4-H and FFA youth as a feeder is going to be looking for, along with overall health gain and feed efficiency. Commercial and purebred producer. Though they sound different, in terms of the actual animals that they are selecting and why they do that, they are actually very similar. They both are going to put a huge emphasis on reproduction, which is the most important thing when raising livestock. You want to make sure that these animals are able to reproduce and have kids every year. That way there is a product to continue down the line with. If there is no product to continue down the line, to the feeder and to the packer and to the consumer, then no one else has a product. So the commercial and purebred producer both have to put a lot of emphasis on reproduction to make sure that we can have a strong market for these animals. Maintenance costs is another thing that they certainly will put a lot of uh, emphasis in. They want to make sure that they aren't putting a lot of money into one individual animal to keep it alive or to keep it reproducing. If that's the case, they're not making any money on that individual animal's offspring. So keeping maintenance costs low for their animals allows them to make more money for every animal sold. And then growth and weaning and yearling weight are certainly going to be something that the producers, commercial or purebred, will put emphasis on. Almost as important as reproducing and having those live kids or lambs every year, Growth and weaning and yearling weight are very important. Once that animal is born, if it does not grow, then there still is no product to move down the line. So keeping those things in mind would be important. Something that I didn't put on here, but the purebred producer might select for would be a pedigree. Uh, that is a record of ancestors for a specific animal. And purebred producers are going to look at that and base their selection on some factors that they see in that pedigree that would maybe correlate to reproduction and growth and some of those other traits that they are selecting for. Another trait that we might be uh, looking at um, to see what uh, we could best or how we can best improve our gains and our growths and our reproduction and our product. Something to keep in mind is heritability. Heritability is just the percentage of the differences in a trait between animals that are transmitted to the offspring. As you see here from this graphic, reproduction is low. Production is in that moderate range. And the actual product, carcass, is in that high heritability range. And that heritability, again, is just a measure of how a trait will respond to selection. So that's important as we are thinking about those traits and things that we just got done talking about. Heritability will determine how those are going to show up and affect the next generation of animals. I'll briefly go through a few traits from each section that are low, middle, or high in heritability. First, some traits that are low would be birth interval, number born, rear legs and structure, udder support, and reproduction. All those things are less than 20% on the heritability scale. You would have to have multiple generations to see improvement with those specific traits. Some traits that fall in that middle range from 20 to about 45 or 50 percent that are moderately heritable are birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, feed conversion, quality grade, ribeye area, and muscling. You start to see we are getting into more carcass and product type of traits, and those are decently heritable. You will see some improvement with those 
from each generation. And traits that are high in heritability, mature weight, milk fat, stature and frame size, overall carcass weight, scrotal circumference, all of those are anywhere from 45 to 65 percent on how heritable they are. Now certainly when we're talking about traits, there are two main kind of traits. You have your qualitative traits. These are traits that are affected by just a single or a very few pair of genes. Coat color would be one, teeth, horns, things of that nature, things that you can see on the outside are qualitative traits. On the other hand, things that you, not, you cannot necessarily see on the outside are your quantitative traits, traits that are affected by numerous pairs of genes. The thousands of genes present make countless combinations possible in an animal. Since genes are too small to identify individually, they express their presence <coughs> by such outward effects as differences in growth, carcass, or reproduction traits. <clears throat> Some quantitative traits are growth traits, like your birth and weaning weights, carcass traits, like ribeye area, marbling, and then those reproduction traits, the fertility and things of that nature. EPDs, expected progeny difference. You probably haven't heard this term used very much in small ruminants, sheep and goats, and that's why all right. This term is used a lot in cattle and even in swine. EPDs haven't been around as long for the sheep and goats, and they are certainly things that can be helpful in selecting for your next generation. So an EPD is the differences in performance expected from the offspring of one individual compared to the offspring of another individual within the same breed. A professor I had once told me, you cannot manage what you do not measure. And so that is what we are doing with EPDs. We are just simply measuring traits that our animals possess and trying to calculate how well those traits are going to pass down to the next generation and how they compare within their contemporaries within that same breed. Record keeping is very important. So keeping or culling, this is essentially the action of making that selection. And so what does that mean? So we have two categories, the breeding or herd replacements, that's gonna be the animals we keep. We're gonna have our cull animals, the animals that don't meet our criteria and that we cull and they get moved down the line to the next stage, whatever that may be. So, I have just a quick scenario for us here to look at. And we are going to be selecting for growth. And we are going to operate thinking in our head that both of these animals were raised in the exact same conditions and that they were given the exact same chance to grow. So we are a commercial producer selecting for growth rate. Both of these kids pictured here are 90 days old. We are wanting to retain one as a buck to produce next year's kids. Which one do you think we would select based on wanting them to have the most growth that they can? I think we would select the goat pictured on the right. Certainly, he appears to be bigger, heavier muscled, seems to be weighing more at 90 days old than the goat pictured on the left-hand side. So if we were only selecting for growth, we would put, pick the animal on the right-hand side. Now, let's make it a little bit harder here. We're gonna be selecting for maintenance costs. Under each animal, there is a short scenario. I'll read through those, and then we will talk about what it means to select for maintenance costs. So doe A, the doe on the far left-hand side. Every year, she produces the highest selling kids. She has to be dewormed every other month though, and she does not keep her body condition up well on pasture alone. You're having to feed this animal all year long. Doe B, she only needs supplemental nutrition when nursing kids. 
However, she has yet to produce a kid that has been retained in the herd. She is only dewormed twice a year. Doe C, dewormed once a year, but however, she gets pneumonia when the weather changes. She needs moderate supplementation throughout the year, and she produces replacement females every single year for us. Now, if we're selecting for one trait, maintenance cost, of these scenarios listed here, doe B is going to be the one that wins. She only needs supplemental nutrition when nursing kids, so you don't have to feed her all year long. She can go out to pasture and do fine. It says she has yet to produce a kid that's been retained in the herd, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If we're selecting for maintenance costs, that doesn't really matter. And she's only dewormed twice a year. So for doe B, we only have a little bit of feed, cost when she's nursing kids and we only have a little bit of cost in dewormer twice a year. Now if you look at doe A, yeah she's producing the highest selling kids every year but she's got to be dewormed every other month. She has a parasite load that we can't get rid of. She seems to get parasites a lot so that's going to cost us money in dewormer and she does not keep her body conditions up well on pasture. So we're going to have to feed this animal throughout the year. So we're going to have to keep feeding this animal, even when she's not nursing, even when she's not bred. We're going to have to keep feeding this animal in order for her to stay in condition that she could go into breeding when we want her to. Doe C, she gets dewormed once a year. So that's probably the best one as far as dewormer. Only one time a year, that's not a lot of cost. But however, she gets pneumonia every time the weather changes. So we're going to have vet cost, cost of medicines. We need to feed this animal supplemental to nutrition throughout the year as well. So even though she's producing those replacement females, the cost that we have in her getting pneumonia makes her maintenance cost higher. So based on those scenarios, doe B is certainly going to be the one we pick. Now, it's not necessarily practical to only select for one trait. Matter of fact, nobody should ever select for one trait because you will select yourself into animals that are only good at one thing. And we want animals that are versatile and we want to select for multiple things at one time. We want to put some more emphasis on different traits. That's certainly fine, but you should never select solely on one trait. So our maintenance cost scenario here Doe B, she wins as far as maintenance costs, but because she has never producing a kid that we keep in our herd, well, maybe we need to get some replacements. We're a pur purebred producer, and we need those kids to be staying in our herd to produce more genetics down the road. But if she's not doing that for us, she's not producing replacements, then it doesn't make much, <coughs> excuse me, much sense for us to keep her. <coughs> so it's just important. Keep in mind that simple scenarios like this, certainly we can select for one trait and find which one's the absolute best. But in reality, when we're out on the farm, selecting for one trait is not feasible. You're going to have to find a combination that works for you at your farm and that makes you money. So just to recap our discussion here on selection, we want to make sure that we are identifying an end goal. If your end goal is to be, be someone that's selling the heaviest kids they can at weaning, then growth traits are gonna be for you. If you wanna be someone that's known for producing the best goat steaks around, then maybe marbling and some of those carcass traits are important to you. If you're a show goat producer and you wanna produce the top genetics to win a state show, then some competitive animals are what you'll be selecting for. That end goal is always important. You should never start anything without having what your end goal is in mind for your product. We need to determine what traits and how well those traits pass on to the next generation. We have to figure out what we want to select for, figure out how heritable that is, and then make sure that we are utilizing uh, the heritability to make those improvements in our herd 
as quickly as we can. And then we're going to want to identify the animals that possess our desired traits and then make sure that we are actually using those animals in the next generation to produce for us. And that is all that I have for our selection part of our Small Ruminant 101. We will have another video talking about genetics and that's where the blueprints come in. We'll see why selection and genetics work so well together. Tune in to our next video where we talk about genetics for small ruminants. Thank you.